next to Pat Reynolds, uh, who has had over 30 years of experience in restoration ecology. Uh, he is the general manager of Heritage Growers uh, and is the director of the River Partners Native Seed and Nursery Program. And those two organizations are connected and he'll describe that in greater detail. <clears throat> He's the former general manager of Hedgerow Farms and uh, has been a rest is a restoration ecologist on the Science and Technical Advisory Board for Yolo County. Uh, he has uh, he's been active in the California Native Grasslands Associations on their board and has been an instructor. And in his uh, off time, he uh, leads a community-based habitat project in, in South Davis in his neighborhood, where he collaborates with his neighbors to plant native oaks, grasses, and wildflowers. And it's my pleasure to turn the meeting over to you, Pat. Oh, very good. Thanks, Dave. Um, I guess I'll try and share my screen and we'll take it from there. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, all right. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about three different things actually. Uh, first, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Heritage Growers. Uh, it's a brand new native seed and plant supply company uh, that I'm sure that you all are quite interested in. A lot of great stuff uh, uh, with Heritage Growers. And then I'm gonna talk about um, sort of some things to consider when you're trying to maximize habitat values in the urban landscape. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna tell you about uh, the project that Dave just mentioned there. This uh, my Neighborhood Habitat Project, which became a class at UC Davis in 2018. So with that in mind, I think I'll just move forward. Um, everybody hear me okay? Dave, thumbs up there? Yeah, good, all right, sounds good. Okay, very good, so, all right. Okay, sorry, so Heritage Growers. Um, so Heritage Growers, it's, it's a brand new native seed and plant supply company. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're providing seeds and plants of known genetic origin for habitat restoration. Uh, and we're doing that through partnerships and collaborations uh, as much as possible. And what we're really trying to do is we're trying to advance um, the use of seed and plugs in habitat restoration so that at the end of the day, we can hopefully improve restoration outcomes. And uh, sort of first and foremost, our uh, Heritage Growers is a program of River Partners. And uh, I think probably a lot of you have heard about River Partners, but, um, but uh, yeah, River Partners is a nonprofit organization organization that implements large-scale riparian habitat restoration projects. Uh, been doing that for more than two decades. And, and in fact, River Partners has implemented 18,000 acres of riparian restoration. So a really incredible amount of habitat restoration has been implemented successfully by River Partners. And through the years, they've done a great job of, of collecting wildland seed and using that seed in the restoration projects and um, also buying native seed commercially. And so Heritage Growers is kind of the long-term goal of River Partners to finally be able to produce their own appropriate native seed for habitat restoration. So that's kind of the outcome of a long-term goal of River Partners. And so um, um, just kind of continuing on with that theme, it's, it's really at the end of the day, it's kind of an expansion of their existing uh, program. Like I said, they used to do a great job of, of and, and will continue to do so uh, of collecting wild land seed and using that effectively on habitat restoration projects. But now we're combining that wild land seed program, which we're organizing and, and sort of making it uh, a lot more efficient, if you will. Um, but we're combining that with, uh, with farm produced native seed. You know, this, this local material, these uh, seed again of known genetic origin. And so right now we have about 11 acres um, that's in the ground. Um, and then we're gonna be adding to that uh, significantly this coming fall. We're gonna be adding something like 139 additional acres. So, so this is a, a sizable and significant uh, native seed and nursery program that we've got going here. Um, uh, our nursery program actually is up and running right now. Uh, we're producing these plugs. These, uh, if you look at the, the picture on the upper left there, uh, these really nice um, high quality plug materials. Um, 
We're in the process also of developing more ecotypes, you know, more source identified uh, plant material, if you will, as well as more species. And again, with the idea here is that we're trying to make these habitat restorations better, more successful, and we want to advance this idea of using seed and plugs in habitat restoration. So, um, so right now, if you kind of see this picture, this sort of triangular piece of ground here, that's our 11 acres that we have in the ground right now. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to, to grow out. We have, well, we are, we have more than 100 different species and ecotypes in the ground right now. Um, you know, and what we're doing, a, a variety of things. Uh, we're increasing some seed that we collected, some wildland seed that we collected last year. So we're trying to increase that so we can do a much bigger field this coming fall. Um, we're establishing um, seed for use in our native plant nursery. So we'll always have a supply of, of source identified native seed. We're trying new species and new ecotypes to try to learn how to, how to produce these, these new materials. And really, at the end of the day, we're trying to learn how to grow this native seed at, the, at, at our farm here, which is in a place called Davis Ranches. Uh, Davis Ranches is a, it's a farm in Calusa County between Calusa and, and Grimes. Um, uh, basically, it's, it's where, this, the, where the Sycamore Slough meets the Sacramento River. Uh, and you can kind of see in the background there, we've got um, the Calusa Alps there in the background as part of that, if you know where that, that sort of part of the world is. So um, we're also known as, as the Sutter Beats. So anyway, um, so, uh, so when you're producing um, seed of known genetic origin, there's a, 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 some of really important processes that are part of that. And so, um, so if you look at these, uh, these three pictures on the top, that's, that's basically river partners cleaning seed um, as they have for, for many, many years using screens, simply just running the, uh, the field material over these screens. And they did a pretty good job of uh, effectively cleaning this, this field material. But now we're in the process of putting together a formal seed cleaning mill where we'll use large machines to, to be able to clean you know, significant amounts of seed that, seeds that we're producing. Another really important part of, of producing the seed, of course, is to, is to do lots of testing and to do that testing with uh, really high quality seed labs. And that's kind of what these the pictures at the bottom sort of represent some of the some seed lab work. You know, so we're we're testing materials that we're collecting in the wild. We're obviously we're going to be testing uh, materials that we're going to plant and we'll be testing the products that we produce as part of that. It's really important that you get really high quality labs to give you good and accurate results in terms of the material that you're producing. And then uh, uh, one of the things that we're, we're doing is contract grow seed amplifications, right? So where we're taking um, small amounts of seed that's been collected from the wild from project proponents and clients and, and basically amplifying that. And then we take a pound of seed and we turn that into a hundred pounds, for example. And, and um, the approaches that we take to, to amplify the seed depend largely upon um, you know, the, the quality of the seed that we have, the number of live seeds, uh, whenever possible, we wanna put those live seeds directly into the ground. But a lot of times, um, because there's a limited number of live seeds, we have to grow them out first into plugs and then, plug, and then put those plugs into the ground. And then uh, another thing that uh, we'll be producing here uh, when we get our native grass in the, in the, start our native grass here this coming fall is, is producing native grass straw. You know, native grass straw is a really great um, erosion control product, a really good tool in your toolbox for habitat restoration. You know, it's a native grasses tends to hold together pretty well, so it provides good erosion control. Uh, it oftentimes can, uh, contains some native grass seed as part of that, which is uh, can be kind of a bonus. And we'll be working with Calusa County so they can examine our fields and they can certify it as noxious weed free. Um, so, so really a great uh, product that we'll be have available starting probably in the fall of 2023. Then, as I mentioned, we have a native plant nursery that's currently up and running. Um, so we have dozens of species uh, and ecotypes that are available in, in tens of thousands of plants. You know, this this kind of this this plug form, these small little high quality plants. Um, the seeds are, are uh, the, the plugs are grown out in phytosanitary uh, conditions, meaning they're clean nursery pro uh, processes, right? So we're, it's a clean nursery operation, which is really, of course, very important nowadays, right? Because we know that um, nursery operations, nursery native operations, if they don't have phytosanitary procedures in place, you can end up developing Phytophthora species, uh, these series of deadly pathogens that can really end up taking sort of, you know, having contaminated plants that then go out into the, 
into wildland settings and, and basically introduce these deadly diseases. So, so it's really important that when you're buying your plant material, um, that you ask the nursery uh, the conditions that they're growing it in. You want to make sure that you're buying plant material that's grown in with clean nursery practices as part of that. Really important part of uh, making sure that at the end of the day you do no harm, right, with, with your habitat restoration. So, make sure the plants that you're buying buying are uh, grown with phytosanitary conditions. Um, so as part of our nursery also, we uh, do contract rows. Uh, so we grow out large numbers of plants for large habitat restoration projects. And we're doing a lot of research and collaboration. You know, for example, we're uh, working with the Xerce Society on some monarch butterfly work. We're trying to figure out different ways to uh, establish um, milkweed and um, nectar species for monarch butterflies, for example. So. And uh, one of the great things about being a program of River Partners is that River Partners is a restoration contractor with more than two decades of experience implementing habitat restoration projects, right? So a really good track record of, of successful restoration implementation. So, so we have the ability at Heritage Growers to work with you know, our, our sister organization, River Partners, to be able to implement these projects. And, and when we do, of course, Heritage Growers will provide that important technical support on the seed and plant side. Uh, of these projects. Okay, so that was Heritage Growers. So now I'm just going to talk to you guys here a little bit about um, different ways to try to maximize habitat values um, in, in urban landscapes. So, um, so it's start, starting off with species selection, right? So we know that, uh, that native species is really one of the keys to maximizing habitat values. Native species uh, provide generally provide higher habitat values uh, than non-native species. We know that from the work of Gordon Frankie at UC Berkeley. Uh, we know that from the work of Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware. You know, native species have evolved, or native wildlife in particular, and particularly insects have evolved with native species. So it, it makes sense that you're gonna get much more habitat values uh, when you're using native species when compared to non-native species, right? And then, um, so kind of taking that to the next level, and sort of keep in mind that, you know, I, I, I sort of approach these uh, a little bit like a habitat restoration project. So you, you won't probably necessarily be able to do all of these things, but sort of, sort of keep that in mind here as I'm sort of talking about this. But I like to approach these as if they are a habitat restoration project. So, so one of the things, uh, you know, when you're trying to, you know, you want to use native species, but you want to try to use a species whose uh, range, uh, at least historically, occurred within uh, your site, if possible. And uh, there's a great source, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Calphora, but it, generally speaking, if you, if you uh, type in the scientific name um, of a particular native species that you're considering, usually um, one of the top, you know, three or four or five uh, uh, options there that pop up in Google is Calphora. And if you click on Calflora, it'll generally, the first thing that pops up is this really great distribution map, right? And so in this particular case, this is a screenshot, you can see with narrow leaf milkweed, there's lots of dots all over California. So it's a pretty widely distributed plant. And so you can use these, um, see these distribution maps as kind of a general indicator if it would be appropriate, you know, to use that particular species um, within your area, you know? So if you got a a blue dot that's pretty close to, to your site or certainly at least within your county, then it's probably a probably a, a good choice there for your habitat garden. And then kind of, kind of then taken to the very next level is whenever possible, try to use uh, local ecotypes. That is um, plant material of known genetic origin that at least occurs within the region, if possible, um, that you're around. And that's a little bit of a harder thing to to, to, to be able to do is, is because there's a limitation on local ecotypes. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we, we founded Heritage Growers is trying to get more ecotypes out there, you know, whenever possible, you know, so, um, and, it, and it certainly is much better to use something that's even of Northern California, for example, genetic origin, as opposed to something that where you don't know where it came from, you know, the, the variety not, not VNS variety not stated. So, you know, even if it's from a, a larger region, it's better to have source identified material than material that that came from who knows where. So, so um, anyway, um, you know that uh, you know plant material of, of known genetic origin. These local ecotypes they're going to be, in most cases, better adapted to the local soils and the climates, the insects and the diseases. Right. So they're going to be more resistant. Um, 
So, you know, whenever you're out there and you're shopping around for your seeds or your plants, you know, ask the seed and nursery supplier about the origin of the material. You know, and if they don't know where the, the material come, came from, so keep that in mind. And if they do know where the material come from, and if they have different choices, pick the material, the source identified material that's most appropriate for your particular site. Okay, kind of moving on here. Um, so if you're really trying to maximize habitat values, a great way to do that is to uh, uh, plant a diverse assemblage of species, right? And, and I always recommend folks to try to like represent as many plant families as possible. You know, we know, for example, that, um, you know, that um, plant diversity and pollinator diversity are, are closely related. We know, for example, that native bees, they tend to specialize on the flower structure. And so if you have lots of different families, you're going to have lots of different flower, flower structures, and you're probably going to end up with a lot more species of bees uh, with a more diverse assemblage than if you had something that's a little bit simpler. And then another kind of rule of thumb is to try to make sure that you have um, plants that are flowering both early, middle, and late. You know, maybe three species in each of those period what is a good target to try to do that so that you don't end up having this gigantic flush of flowers in April or May and then not much habitat, right? At the end of the day, you want something that's starting to flower and or parts of your garden that are starting to flower in February or March, and, then, and you have flowering plants all the way through into October or November, right? So, so make sure you have varied flowering periods as part of that diversity. And so if you end up, you know, with a, a diverse assemblage of plants, what's going to end up happening, you're going to have create um, complex habitat structure. And complex habitat structure is another way to uh, maximize habitat values. The, the basically, the, you know, having lots of different nooks and crannies and textures and things like that, you know, is gonna end up at the end of the day, again, providing you with much higher habitat values. Okay, um, another thing to keep, to keep in mind also is, uh, you know, using, Moth and moth and butterfly host plant species, right? Um, we know that moths and butterflies have an evolutionary relationship with with plants. Um, it's a requirement for for their life cycle that they be able to complete their life cycle with certain plant species. You know, the kind of the classic example, of course, is milkweed, right? Um, in the absence of milkweed, um, monarch butterflies could not uh, complete their life cycle. They have to have milkweed in order to be able to. To have their the cat they lay their eggs and those caterpillars have to feed on milkweed otherwise they can't survive and so that's the case uh, with moths and butterflies in general I mean they they tend to have uh, um, certain host plants that they're able to use so you want to make sure that you're using uh, lots of different moth and butterfly host plant species and we know the work from Doug Tallamy um, I think uh, I was talking to Dave here a little bit earlier uh, you know a lot of his work at the University of Delaware. Um, basically found that the importance of native plants uh, for the production of caterpillars. And we know that those caterpillars, of course, end up providing a lot of habitat, a lot of food for nesting birds. So, so if you want to sort of be able to provide high habitat values within your garden that go beyond sort of just the plants and the insects, you know, if you produce a lot of a lot of um, caterpillars, you're going to end up um, helping out with nesting birds, right? Because uh, the vast majority of nesting bird species use caterpillars to feed their young. So anyway, um, another great uh, source of information on that is calscape.org. Same thing, you know, you type in the scientific name into Google. Um, uh, Calscape is going to be one of your choices and it lists the, the likely and confirmed um, um, host uh, um, moth and butterflies that use that particular species. So it's a really great way to make sure you're using uh, plants that provide habitat for moths and butterflies, calscape.org. Okay, another thing you want to do is you want to uh, make sure that you're uh, providing, um, you know, combination of both annuals and perennials, right? So, you know, the perennials, they, they, uh, they tend to provide good structure in your garden. Um, they, they live longer, so they're more resilient. And of course, um, that's part of the diversity that you're trying to maximize at your, in your gardens. Um, and of course, annuals also, um, you know, um, they tend to provide a really important function. They, they have a lot of high value for pollinators, for example, and they're really a great way to add diversity. And so if you put annuals and perennials together, what you're going to end up happening is, is creating complex habitat structure. And that complexity by itself helps us to maximize habitat values. Let's see. Okay, um, so just going to talk a little bit about native bunch grasses, right? Um, 
So native bunch grasses are a really great thing to include um, uh, in habitat gardens. Uh, they're, they tend to provide great foundational plants. You know, they really kind of set the stage for the rest of your garden. Um, native bunch grasses are actually host plants a lot of times for moths and butterflies. So getting back to that. Um, a couple of the things about native bunch grasses that are really important is that they tend to have these very deep roots. Uh, those deep roots provide channels that basically allow water to infiltrate deep into the soil. You know, a, a really important thing that we want to do is we want to be able to hold on to that water as much as possible, you know, um, <clears throat> so that when the rain stops, we've got, you know, we've accumulated that water into the soil profile and then it becomes plant available for, for plants uh, in the dry season. So a really important thing to do is to, is to have these, you know, native bunch grasses really absorb all of that water. You know, we saw like this year, for example, and, uh, you know, the rains came in, in, you know, we had huge amounts of rains in October and huge amounts of rains in December. And if you have, uh, you know, bunch grasses that are in place that have the ability to, to promote water infiltration, that, that water then becomes available later in the season. The thing that's great about uh, bunch grasses too is they, they tend to build soils. Uh, you know, their, their roots uh, expand and contract. Uh, through that process, they're, they're basically, they're sequestering carbon, they're taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. And so it's kind of a great way to, you know, to combat global climate change in your garden, right? So, uh, so it's a, a kind of a nice sort of benefit also to using lots of, of native bunch grasses. And, you know, I think in general, it's better to use a diversity of native grass species uh, as part of that. Um, I read a paper, um, I think it was done in the uh, paper where they, they looked at uh, sort of a diverse native grassland on the East Coast compared to one that was not so diverse. And they basically found that that diversity helped to sequester even more carbon because it ended up um, basically filling more niches in the soil profile. And so it was more effective to have a, a diverse uh, native grassland area than, than say one that was not so diverse. So use lots of different species of native grasses as part of your habitat garden. And then, of course, you want to use perennial plants too, right? Uh, those perennial plants, um, just like the, just like those native bunch grasses, provide their important foundational plants. Of course, they're going to live longer, so they're going to provide a more resilient landscape. Um, they add to that important diversity that we that we know is so important when you're trying to maximize habitat values. You know, and they oftentimes have a um, semi-woody or a woody structure, and that that ends to that tends to create more habitat complexity, right? You have a different texture, you have a different feel, there's, there's different shapes and sizes of that. So I definitely use lots of perennial uh, flowering plants as well. And then of course you wanna use lots of annual flowers also. I think, I think all of us really love annual wildflowers, right? Um, they're spectacular. They tend to provide really great habitat for pollinating insects, for example. And, it, and it's a really great way to add diversity, right? If you use a high quality seed mix, it's got you know, seven or eight or nine different species that are in there. It's a really a great way to be able to, to add that important diversity to, to maximize those habitat values. Yeah, let's see. All right. Okay, um, so now I'm just gonna uh, take a minute and talk a little bit about milkweed. Um, so uh, as we talked about, milkweed is a host plant for monarch butterflies, right? So. Uh, Monarchs, of course, are in trouble. We, they've rebounded quite a bit this year, but the long-term trend for monarch butterflies is not good. And so it's a, uh, by establishing milkweed um, within your habitat gardens, you can really make a difference, you know? So um, anyway, but, but um, you know, and then I should also say that like, like milkweed also is just, it's a great plant outside of monarch butterflies. They tend to provide a lot of habitat for a lot of uh, different species. It's a really good insectary plant in and of itself, so kind of keep that in mind. But one thing about one thing about milkweed, it's really challenging to establish, right? Um, so milkweed, for example, um, for most species, they don't even they, the seeds don't even germinate until until February or so, right? And so, so if you're if you're just starting to germinate in February, you can imagine the competition when you're going up against, you know non-native annual grasses that have germinated in October or even other natives that, that have germinated uh, much earlier. So it becomes, a, it's very difficult for milkweed to compete against that stuff, right? Um, so, you know, I heard lots of stories when I was at Hedgerow Farms about the difficulty of establishing milkweed. So what we ended up doing is uh, doing a trial at Hedgerow. Um, we also did a companion trial with the Xerces Society and the NRCS Plant Materials Center. And, 
we looked at planting different milkweed uh, with seeds and with the plugs. And for showy milkweed, we did uh, rhizomes. And, and what we found is that all, all of those methods work well for establishing milkweed, but you have to give them extra care and attention, right? So you know, not all milkweed, but a lot of milkweed, for example, um, they tend to occur in wetter locations. So you're gonna wanna make sure you give them a little bit of extra water. Uh, the importance of really controlling those weeds is, is absolutely critical. Um, now, if you're, uh, if you're kind of just starting out, like uh, the narrow leaf milkweed Asclepius sicularis or showy milkweed Asclepius speciosa, they tend to be the easiest to establish and they're the most available in terms of plant material. So that's a great way to sort of get off the ground and get some milkweed established within your yards. Um, one thing that the Xerces Society uh, doesn't recommend is uh, planting milkweed within five miles of the coast. Um, so you folks that might be in West Marin County, um, maybe as opposed to planting milkweed, you know, within your yards, you know, concentrate on, on providing uh, nectar species, you know, flowering plants. Um, uh, there is some concern about the disruption of the, of the migration of, of monarch butterflies. They think that milkweed um, real cl close to the coast could uh, disrupt the overwintering of the, of the monarchs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so if you're within five miles of the coast, um, you know, concentrate more on planting those nectar species and, and, and probably not milkweed. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk about one tree today, and that's the valley oak, Quercus lobata. Now, now I, I know that in, in, in Marin County, for example, uh, valley oak certainly does occur there, but, um, you know, it, it could be that there are other species that are more appropriate. Um, so when I'm talking about the valley oak here, you can go ahead and substitute other species because they have similar high value habitat characteristics. So maybe it might be more appropriate, for example, in your neighborhood to plant coast live oak as opposed to, to valley oak. But nonetheless, um, so valley oak, it's, a, uh, it's endemic to California, meaning it occurs nowhere, nowhere else. Um, it's the largest oak in North America, and I'm pretty sure it's the largest oak in the world. Right, this um, these gigantic trees that grow very very quickly. Um, but really, the kind of the, the the really great thing about valley oak is it, it supports a tremendous diversity and abundance of insects. Right, it's like an insect factory. You know, if you go back to Calscape, we were talking about that. It lists you know 17 confirmed, 151 likely moth and butterflies that use the valley oak as a host plant. Right, so really, in and of itself it can provide a lot of habitat for moths and butterflies amongst everything else. So there's some great, great experimental evidence that sort of backs that up as well. Um, there's a study that was done in 2018 by Dan Rollo and Steve Greco at UC Davis. They went into a neighborhood in Sacramento called Curtis Park. It's a really spectacular sort of leafy neighborhood, um, you know, kind of um, uh, in Sacramento. And, what they did is they did a three-year study of migratory birds, and they compared the, the migratory bird use that were present within um, uh, the non-native tree canopy, which made up the majority of the tree canopy. And they also looked at the, at the migratory birds that were present uh, in the valley oaks. And at the end of the day, almost all of the, almost all of the bird use was in the valley oaks, even despite the fact that it was a very small percentage of the, um, of the overall tree canopy. So... I'm not hearing a little noise in the background there. Dave, I don't know if, if folks might want to mute or something or, you know. Anyway, um, so, and then one, one other thing to keep in mind also is that like, um, you know, so if you're going to plant an oak tree, you know, a valley oak or coast live oak or whatever is appropriate, uh, make sure that you keep that leaf litter as, as best you can. That leaf litter actually is an important part of the life cycle of a lot of moth species, right? Uh, um, uh, if you end up, um, you know, sort of sweeping away the, that, those leaves, oftentimes you're going to be sweeping away the, the chrysalis of the moth. So try to keep that leaf litter uh, when you're growing out your oak trees. And, and I would say just one thing I would say overall is that, um, you know, if you had to do one conservation action, you know, uh, in your yards, um, I would plant a native oak tree. You know, I think really, if you only had one thing that you could do, I would plant a native oak tree because of just because of the high habitat values that they provide. All right. Uh, okay. Just uh, talking about some things that you can incorporate into your yard, yard to, to maximize habitat features. Uh, one of those is, is, uh, is water features, right? And, and I mean, right now, of course, it's really important that all of us be very careful with, with the water that we use, right? Um, 
you know, uh, we're in the third year of a, of a very severe drought yet again. And so we have to be very judicious in the, in the water that we use. But, but, but adding water to your, art, your yard has such high value to that, that I think it's okay. I think you can feel okay about adding some water features to your yards. I, I actually think about this as environmental water, right? So if you're, if you can think of like the, one of the highest and best uses of water, that would be to create a little bit of a water feature within your, within your habitat areas. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that. So for example, uh, if you have some wet spots uh, within your yard, it's gonna basically allow you to plant additional plant diversity, right? So if you've got wet locations, you're gonna be able to plant and establish a lot, a lot broader suite of species than you would be able to in the absence of having um, water features or wet spots, right? So it adds that important habitat diversity also, of course, it provides habitat for water features and water for birds and bees and wildlife in general. Um, uh, we were talking about the importance of complexity. You know, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, you're going to end up with uh, creating um, more complexity by having you know, areas where water will be able to the pond. And, and it has a lot of other ancillary benefits as well. Like, for example, probably a lot of you have, have seen um, Butterflies that are on the ground, uh, sort of seemingly trying to drink up, uh, you know, muddy areas, and, and what they're doing is they're trying to—they're uptaking nutrients, right? They need that mud to be able to uptake, uptake nutrients. So, so adding water features can really provide a lot of um, habitat bang for your bucket, if you will. Um, boulders are another thing to add. Um, they provide that important habitat complexity. Lots of nooks and crannies. Um, Definitely, you know, adding to that really the importance of adding, um, you know, habitat complexity to your yard. So consider adding boulders when you can. Um, of course, what do you debris? So of course, what do you debris is really an important feature. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, if you're placing logs or creating, um, you know, um, piles of wood or things like that, that adds that important habitat complexity. You know that um, there are a number of nesting of native bees that nest in wood, so you're creating potential habitat for uh, wood nesting bees. Uh, we also know that a lot, a lot of insects they'll overwinter um, underneath things like logs, so you provide important overwintering habitat. Um, of course, woody debris, of course, it's gonna it's gonna break down through time, and it's gonna add organic matter to those soils. Uh, that organic matter acts as a sponge, so it helps with that soil, the retaining that soil moisture, the importance of that that we were talking about earlier. Uh, we know that there are a lot of different insect species that rely on decaying wood to survive. Um, so one of the things I, I recommend folks do if you are working on um, sort of tree work in your yard, um, you know, or your neighbor, or even someone in your neighborhood is having tree work done, you know, go talk to the, go talk to the arborist, the, the, the tree guys, and, and Ask them if they can, um, if you can keep as many of the long branches as possible. You know, that sort of outer 15 feet or so of branches, they're, they're, great, um, they're great pieces of wood that tend to have lots of complexity um, that, that if you put those together, they can act um, to, um, to provide really uh, interesting um, and, and good looking um, wood features, uh, they can provide borders, uh, you know, along your garden, things like that. So, so, you know, go ahead and be kind of an ambulance chaser and try to get the, uh, the folks in your neighborhood to, when that the tree work is being done to be able to save, you know, some of those pieces for your habitat garden. Okay, substrate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about substrate, right? So, um, so I think it's important to include both mulched areas as well as bare soil areas within your gardens, right? Um, so mulch, mulch areas, they, they of course tend to help to retain moisture, which of course is really important. Uh, they'll help to build the soils. You're gonna add organic matter to the soils, of course. Um, they're gonna provide a barrier to help to control weeds. Um, it's gonna help to increase that water infiltration that we were talking about about earlier, and they also, you know, it, it acts as kind of a duff layer, right? And that duff layer has its own suite of insects that, that it supports. So, so definitely use mulch areas, but it's also important that you use uh, that you maintain some bare soil areas as well, right? Uh, we know that, for example, um, something like seventy percent of native bees nest in the ground, and they're not going to nest in the ground in three or four inches of mulch. So, you want to make sure you're having some bare soil areas so you can provide some of that habitat for, um, for ground nesting bees. I think a lot of times uh, it's the nesting habitat that's more limiting uh, 
um, than, than say the you know the, um, the foraging habitat. So make sure you're definitely providing some bare soil areas as, as part of your habitat garden. And so then if you put those together, if you include some areas that are bare soil and some areas that um, that have uh, mulch, you're, you're providing that important habitat complexity. And with that, you're gonna be increasing your habitat values. Okay, um, so uh, it was requested that I talk a little bit about lawn replacement. So I, I thought it'd be kind of fun to tell you a little bit about my story about replacing my, my lawn. Um, so back in uh, the fall of 2020, um, we elected to uh, essentially to take out the current lawn that we have in our house in South Davis. Um, kind of a, a long and arduous process, but we got, our, got rid of the, the front lawn. And then we, um, we planted it with uh, uh, plugs of Carex pragacillus or, or slender sedge. Um, and we planted them on, on, on eight inch centers throughout the, throughout the front yard there. So um, ended up being something like, uh, I think about 1800 plugs that ultimately got put in the ground uh, in the front yard. And so, um, and then by the by the um, by the spring of 2021, what ended up happening is we started getting natural recruitment of native wildfires that were coming within within our uh, within our Carex pragacillus. So if you look in here, you can see um, you know Cicerinki and Bellum. You know that's, that's sort of recruiting into our yard yards. But kind of the most interesting thing of all uh, was that we ended up with all these sunflowers that came into our yards. They just recruited. You know they grew in the in the spaces in between our, our Carex pragacillus. <laughs> And we ended up with, uh, you know, just a, a humming activity of bees, right? These, these spectacular longhorn bees, you know, that would just, you know, spend all day foraging within these sunflowers. And, you know, we got to be, uh, most of our neighbors thought that was, you know, they got a kick out of it. They knew that we were doing this to create pollinator habitat. So, uh, so that was not a problem. And then by the end of the season, you know, uh, come fall, we, we took the, we took the, uh, um, the sunflowers out, and essentially here's kind of uh, some folks we did some weeding in there. Um, I think I mowed the mowed it just one time, you know, to kind of get it back to sort of sort of where it was, and and um, and now here we are in the spring, and we're getting wildfires that are uh, sort of popping up again as part of that. So anyway, the, the great thing about a lawn replacement strategy using Carex pragacillus, um, or if you're on the coast, Carex pansa, is that um, they're a really great plant in terms of, in terms of like if you get to the point where you just can't water anymore, for example, they're, they're, once they're established, they'll just go dormant, right? They'll, they'll brown out, they'll just go, go dormant, and they'll just kind of wait until the next time that the rains occur or the next time you water the lawn, and then it's going to green up again. Also with those two species, Carex panza and Carex pragacillus, um, is you can mow it, and they respond really well to mowing. You can really get that turf look if it's really important for you to be able to sort of have that turf look as part of it. So anyway, um, that's my story of, of lawn replacement, and I'm happy to field any questions at the end about sort of what we did and what you might want to consider. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the third part of my talk, which is uh, talking about my neighborhood habitat project. Now, I call this the Willow Bank Habitat Improvement Program. This is kind of a name I made up. Um, uh, WIP, you know, uh, is the acronym for that. And, and um, so basically, it's, it's neighbors that are kind of working together to to try to improve habitat values in the old Willow Bank neighborhood in South Davis. Um, started out uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, uh, basically, um, what had ended up happening about, about 20 years ago, um, you know, the, the Chinese hackberry trees that were planted in our neighborhood in the, in the late 1940s um, started to decline. You know, they started raining branches on cars, for example, that were parked underneath them. Um, Clearly, they had they had sort of uh, they were starting to come to the end of their useful life, and so the neighbors got together, and what we did is we planted trees in between those Chinese hackberry trees, and we planted mostly valley oak, not all, but mostly valley oak. And then about eight years ago or so, we went we ended up going doing a second round of uh, planting, sort of a you know kind of a maintenance and a tree replacement, if you will, and some of the stuff that had not taken. And um, with that, we also you know during that same time period, we also added this. Uh, pollinator habitat component, right? So, it, so then it ended up being this kind of program where we're planting valley oaks in the neighborhood as well as pollinator uh, patches. And anyway, there's a, a professor at UC Davis named Mark Lubell. He's a social scientist. Uh, he got wind of, the, of this project and 
he really loves these projects where social science and natural resources come together. And so he's really sort of excited about this. And so, you know, we talked about it quite a bit. And then ultimately it ended up becoming a class at UC Davis in 2018, spring of 2018, called Social Ecological Connectivity in an Urban Context. Kind of a mouthful, but um, but what we ended up doing as part of that um, was we got, was we, we got 18 of 18 households to participate in, in the study. Um, we looked at the, ecolo the ecology of value and plant ecology and pollinator ecology. And we did a spatial analysis, a map work as part of that. And then we had the social science component of that. And so we were basically looking at the sort of the, yeah, like the, the social and ecological implications of the project. And here's kind of the group of students uh, from UC Davis that were that were part of this class, right? Um, anyway, um, so I'm just going to tell you uh, some of the results that we found that were I thought were particularly interesting. So, uh, so one of the things we did was a little bit of historical ecology work. Oops, sorry, hopefully you guys can't. All right, a little bit of historical ecology work, and we looked at aerial photos. And so, um, so for example, uh oh, you guys seeing that? Let me try to get rid of that. So for example, if you look at the aerial photos here, um, so on the left is a photo from 1937, this one's from 1952, and this one's from 2018. And you can see back in 1937 that uh, Willow Bank was at the time was just a wheat field, right? And it had just a couple of patches, you know, on the outsides of, some, of Valley Oak. And then by 1952, the Willow Bank uh, neighborhood was starting to develop. You can see the roads that have been carved in and here. You can see these uh, tiny dots. What those are are is the Chinese hackberry trees. But even in, in 52, there really wasn't a lot of values, right? You know, not, not much different than what we saw in 37. But if you go back and you look in 2018, you know, you look at all these green, you know, all the all the green in here, that's all value, right? So that so the value is really through time, the canopy has increased through time. So we're starting to get sort of you know, some, some Valley of Woodland-like characteristics within our neighborhood in, to some degree. And some of the things that the students found is that generally the, the trees were very healthy, right? So they, they came up with a, a way of assessing the health of the trees based primarily on structure. And nearly all of the trees that were present uh, were, you know, the highest health and vigor, if you were. Um, there's a diverse array of size classes from saplings to small trees all the way up to large and medium trees. Uh, you know, we found that the values grow very fast, you know, that, uh, like, again, like in 52, there uh, very few trees that are present, and by 2018, there's quite a bit of pretty large trees that are present, right? So in an area that has decent soils um, and, um, you know, decent amount, decent amount of sun, the value oak can grow very, very fast. And again, at the end of the day, we were trying to, what we think is trying to form some value oak type characteristics within our neighborhood. Then for plant ecology, um, so the students found there were about 53 native plant species that were present within these pollinator plots. Um, they found that there was a relationship between the patch size and the plant and insect diversity, right? So the larger your pollinator habitat plot, the more plant and insect diversity that you found. Um, they found that, uh, you know, that uh, there were higher plant diversity in, uh, within the pollinator plants as compared to the controls. And the students at the end of the day, they recommended that for folks to continue on to continue to, you know, plant a diverse assemblage of species uh, to try to maximize habitat values. Um, and then for the, the pollinator ecology results, um, so they found essentially that um, the pollinator plots uh, provided higher insect uh, diversity than in the controls, which was pretty defined, right? And that Pat, unfortunately, you've frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, let's see. Pat, if you can hear me, turn off your uh, uh, video and then turn it back on again. See if that'll fix it.
it looks like he's going to come back in. So we'll. Hey, Dave, can you hear me? I can. OK. Um, let me see. Uh, should I try to share my screen again and see where we're at with that? Yes, yes. OK. All right. OK, how about now? Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. OK, very good. All right. Well, good. Good, re good recovery. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this darn technology, right? So. OK, so um, social science, uh, that was a really interesting part of this uh, program as well. Um, what the students end up doing is they uh, they sat down for 45 minutes to an hour and they interviewed each of the one representative, at least from each of the, of the different 18 households that participated. Um, you know, they asked them kind of somewhat open ended questions about, you know, uh, what they thought was important about the project they were participating in. Um, what were their environmental values? What did they think about valley oaks and fallen earth habitat and things like that? And one of the particularly interesting things that they did is that each household was given a sheet of paper where they were asked to, to check um, any, a sheet of paper that everybody that was listed on the project was on there and they were asked to check if they had talked to those individuals about the project, right? And from that, they, they, could, they could essentially figure out like the social connections that were being made from this project. And, and so this, um, uh, this figure in here that looks a little bit like a spiral graph, or you guys remember that from back in the day, um, this is uh, the social network analysis that was created. And you can see all of these lines show the different connections that people made because they talked to each other about the project. And, and the idea here is that the, the larger the circle, um, uh, the more connections that you had. And you can kind of see that I'm, I'm Reynolds, I'm in the center, I've got the largest circle because of course I have to talk to everyone for the project. But it was a really great way to see that. Like there was a lot of like, you know, connections that were made from this project, right? And um, some of the other things that came, in, came out of that is people really have a keen sense of place here living in this, this special neighborhood, you know, this little big neighborhood. They really enjoyed that, took a lot of pride in that. People tend to have strong environmental values. Um, they recognize the importance of strong leadership, right? Because it, it, it was a lot of work to, or is a lot of work to sort of get people to motivate them to um, you know, plant native trees and, and native wildflowers, for example. Um, one of the sort of cool things that came out of this also that there seems to be this relationship between ecological diversity and social connectivity. So these, you know, um, these sites that had uh, more ecological diversity tend to have more social connections. That was kind of fun. So um, anyway, so kind of some of the things that came out, some of the conclusions included the fact that, you know, that the value of canopy increased, increased through time uh, from both natural recruitment as well as our planting efforts, um, that these valley oaks, you know, they're well adapted to local conditions and they tend to grow very quickly and they have high health and vigor, you know, very different than those Chinese hackberry trees that we started with. Uh, we know that plant diversity and pollinator diversity are closely related, right? You know, the more diversity of plants that you have, the more diversity of pollinating insects that are going to use them. Um, we know that the plant and pollinator diversity was higher in our pollinator plots when compared to controls, the sort of the, you know, more of the standard landscaping. Um, and at the end of the day, the project increased both the uh, the social as well as the ecological health of the neighborhood. So uh, pretty interesting results for sure. So anyway, um, so that's it for my presentation today. I wanted to make sure that um, credit was given to some of the photos, um, including some of these photos from the late great John Anderson, right? Um, one of the most important conservationists here in, in the history of California, right? The founder of Hedro Farms and, and guy that really promoted a lot. So, so some of these photos came from John. Um, and so with that, um, that's the end. Um, I welcome folks to feel free to contact me. Um, that's my email address. Uh, there's my phone number. Um, you know, happy to chat about your projects and we'll give you some advice on how you might be able to maximize habitat values in your regards. So. Well, that's it. Um, there are quite a few uh, comments and questions uh, in the chat, which I can okay, through great. with you. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Julie Whitman asks, what are ecotypes? And Felicia Pacifica quotes from Wikipedia, which I can read. In evolutionary, 
evolutionary ecology and ecotype, sometimes called ecospecies, describes a genetically distinct geographic variety, population, or race within a species, which is genotypically adapted to specific environmental conditions, which is a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, you any yeah, kind of any of other any other comments on that, Pat? Yeah, sure. Uh, in more simple terms, um, an ecotype really uh, is like it's kind of a location, if you will, of where the plants originally came from, right? So the so you could have an ecotype that comes from you know the Sacramento Valley, or you could have an ecotype that comes from Marin County, right? So those are those are sort of two different ecotypes. You might have the the Chico ecotype of of California poppy and the you know I don't know the um, Sausalito ecotype of of California poppy, you know, it's kind of a location-based thing, and it's the, and each of those different locations have their own sort of evolutionary pressures that have sort of formed, uh, and that's why the, so if you're in Sausalito, you want to use the, the, the poppy that came from Sausalito because it's going to be better adapted than say the, the poppy that came from the Sacramento Valley. Alicia asks, are your, your plant choices ever informed by paleobotanical research? Oh. That's a great um, paleo, yeah. Um, that's a little bit beyond my pay grade. Um, um, I, you know, um, I think we rely on what's what we know about has occurred in more recent historic times, right? So, uh, what we know, what the, uh, you know, um, basically that's within the historic record. I think we rely primarily on that as opposed to. Um, you know, sort of paleo choices, I would say, yeah. Uh, Laura Lovett uh, points out there's a handout on our website identifying which butterfly species need which host plant species. And it, it gives the uh, the link if that's of Excellent. interest. Excellent, that's great. And, there, and, and there's, there's a whole uh, in the garden section, which has a lot of how-to information there that you can browse. Excellent. Peggy Thau asks, uh, any specific bunch grasses for home gardens that can also be firewise, or is that an impossibility? Is it mostly a matter of keeping them away from the house? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, you know, I, I I think that uh, native bunch grasses they tend to um, they tend to stay greener longer, you know, if you will, um, than say non-native annual grasses, right? So I would say that. Uh, th there might be a little bit of a fire advantage to those or less of a fire advantage to those. Um, yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, I think some of these longer lived um, sort of workhorse species are, are, are really good in the native garden. Uh, Stipopulchra, you know, the uh, purple needle grass is a good one. Um, Elemis glaucus, um, that one is, uh, tends to be a nice workhorse species. Um, in shady locations, Elmus triticoides tends to be a really good one um, as part of that. Um, yeah, there's other nice ones. Uh, you know, the Stuka idahoensis can be a nice one to have. Milica californica is another good species. Um, the, two, the two that have done particularly well in my yard and stay green come what may are uh, Pacific reed grass, Calmagrostis nutkensis, if it's given a little oh. shade. It's very nice, dry okay. tolerant and it's very robust and green. Yeah. It never dries yeah. out for me. And the yeah. other is California fescue, which is yeah. my go-to plant for almost everything. I mean, it's very adaptable and stays green, although it does develop a lot of thatch you have to deal with from time to time. Yeah, it's a, a, a Festuca californica is my favorite uh, bunch grass, just a and, really and spectacular. Spread, I, I, I now have a lawn. It, it's a lawn about two feet high, but it, uh, both of those uh, almost from their yeah. spread. Uh, nice, yeah. Uh, there are some other comments on the bunch grasses uh, from Stacy Pogorzelski. I cut my bunch grasses to three to four inches height in late summer if they're in a location that seems fire dangerous. And that, that does mimic some of the browsing of elk, for example. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a fair thing to do. Certainly, you reduce that, that the fuel right after they've gone dormant. I think that's you know I try to you know when the, when uh, fire is not as much of a danger, um, I try to ha hold on to my um, I, I try to wait a little longer before I, I I cut those back. But I think that's perfectly appropriate. Yeah. Laura Lovett says yes. The fire agencies think of grasses as fuel, 
but it's the annual grasses that dry out much faster that are most of the problem. Perennial bunch grasses will stay green much later in the summer because of the deeper roots, which is a point that you've made. Uh, is, Betsy Crawford asks whether it's possible to have access to the Valley Oak study. Sure. Yeah. Send me an email. Yeah. It's a, it's, you know, the, the study is, a, it's, now keep, keep in mind there are undergraduate students that wrote this. Um, but yeah, happy to, happy to share that. Just send me an email. It's right on the screen there, prereynolds at heritagebrewers.com. And Hillary Winslow comments that a water gripper is my favorite addition to the garden. Nice. And, and I've got a waterfall and a pond, which just attracts great assemblage of birds. Excellent. Uh, Barb Kababi says, coarse woody debris, does this become fire fuel? Well, you know, of course. I, I mean, it, it, it can become fuel, right? You're putting wood on the ground. Absolutely. There's no, I mean, can't, can't uh, there's no denying that, right? But, um, you know, it's, uh, and it, that would be, you'd have to consider that as part of a larger strategy for, you know, becoming, um, trying to minimize potential fuels within your yard, you know, try to keep those, for example, away from your house would be a good idea, I would think. Yeah. But certainly, you know, you can't avoid that. It's wood. Esme Howard uh, uh, asks about bare soil. It says, in my garden, that just becomes an oxalis patch. Any suggestions beyond daily weeding, or does bare soil include a planted unmulched area? Well, you, you can actually get sometimes uh, some bare soil that occurs like underneath the canopy of some. So for example, I found a ground nesting uh, bee underneath the canopy of, of uh, Cilia californica, right? So there ended up being some bare soil that was created by that shade. Uh, but you know, that, that's a point well taken. It, it, uh, it, it does take a lot of weeding oftentimes to be able to maintain those areas as bare soil. Um, you know, if you have areas that um, have some sand, uh, those can tend to, to stay bare soil for longer. Um, but but that's, a, that, that's a very, uh, that's again, point well taken. It's like it takes, a, it, it can take some extra work to keep those areas uh, open. Yeah. And, and Laura asks, are there native grasses or grass mixes that will hold up well to lots of foot traffic? How about native turf for sports fields? Um, yeah, uh, well, I know there's, a, um, there's the Delta Bluegrass Company, right? That's in the Delta. Uh, they actually have uh, native turf mixes that, that work pretty well. Um, so that's a, a, so one example, but you know, these, these turfs that they're, it's really expensive, right. To, to put down uh, native turf as part of that. But, but I, I know the, you know, um, they can do, they can do well uh, with foot traffic and things like that. I think the examples that I provided of the, of the um, Carex pragicillus and the Carex panza, you know, um, you can mow those, uh, those really do. I mean, those aren't native grasses, but they certainly are grass like and they, and they definitely stand up well to foot traffic. So I think those are, you know, good options for that. You know, you can mow them, you know, once they're established and, and it looks just like a regular lawn, right? So. And you've just answered the next question from Bob Skinner. Could you provide names of the two bunch grasses you mentioned, the sedges? Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh, and Kristen, Christine Jacob, if you want to know what the, how they're spelled, Christine Jacob put that in the chat. Excellent. Uh, Julie Bongers says, I'm a little puzzled by your recommendation for Carex Panza. Does a native yeah. garden neighbors planted in 2005 on a huge median strip in Oakland that's about a mile from the bay? And the Carex Panza compared to all the other plants is way out of control. Over the years, mm -hmm. it's appeared to have displaced other native meadow plants. We do weed as needed, but no one has watered for 20 years, over 20 years. Yeah. Well, um, isn't that a nice problem to have, right? It's vigorous. That, yeah. And so if you wanted to, you know, um, again, this is a lawn replacement idea, right? So usually with lawn replacements, you have control of those, those areas, right? But, uh, you know, to, to be in a situation where they're growing so aggressively that it, uh, you know, that it's uh, getting out of your garden, well, that's, that's a, kind of a nice to have a, a weedy native, right? I think this is a comment from Laura rather than a question. Carex panza near the coast or Carex progressilis further inland? Carex panza on the coast, right? Its, it's native distribution is just a thin strip along the coast, right? So that's Carex panza. 
Carex pragacillus can occur both uh, in coastal areas as well as inland. You know, so for example, the the Carex uh, pragacillus in my front yard uh, came from the Yolo bypass here um, originally. That's the ecotype, and then, but also I, I think uh, Hedgerow Farms had a uh, Carex pragacillus that came from Tiburon. So that's a you know, so you have sort of they have different ecotypes, if you will. So you choose the one that's um, best suited for your area, right? So like, for example, if I were in Marin County, I would take the Tiburon one versus the one from Yellow County, right? So. And Suzanne Carter has a uh, comment on the same subject. Uh, agree to maybe use a foothill species away from the coast. Carex pansa is native to sandy regions along the coast. Carex pregracillus is also very aggressive. I prefer Carex tomicicola uh, uh, in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's uh, legitimate, you know, and uh, I think those are all appropriate. Yeah. And Stacy uh, asked, how would you recommend one start a neighborhood habitat restoration group? Oh, very good. Yeah. Well, um, it's good if you have a, a close uh, neighborhood to start with. Uh, if there's some kind of a uh, sort of group email that 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 goes out periodically. I think that's a great way to do it. So for example, in my neighborhood, um, you know, in Willow Bank, we have a, a, a sort of a, not really a homeowners association, but it's a club. And, and so um, we have a group email. We end up uh, as part of that, we do a, an annual um, barbecue as part of that. So, um, so trying to get, you know, some, 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 something that where you have a group uh, let's see, or you have some connections from the beginning is really helpful. Um, in the absence of that, um, hmm, you know, I don't know, I might even start with one neighbor at a time, right? So you start with your uh, your immediate neighbor and you talk to them about that and maybe you go in on some plants and some seed and and pretty soon it, uh, it might be able to expand from there. <clears throat> and Julie Whitman comments that ecotype seems so arbitrary to me, though a, a plant newbie. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, you know, it's you wouldn't think that like a poppy that comes from the coast would be different from the poppy that comes inland, but but they're very different. Um, so um, so for example, um, different ecotypes of California poppy, for example, they'll look different. One will be yellow, one will be orange. Um, one will uh, flower very early, one will flower very late. You know, it's it's a uh, it's it's they're very consistent patterns. So for example, like when we're growing out different ecotypes of Elemis glaucus, we have to treat each one differently. One's going to produce seed much more early, so we have to be ready to be able to collect that material much more early. Uh, some will hold on to the seed, some will disperse the seed. It's these, it's very, it's, you wouldn't think that's the case, but it's like, they're very different, right? It's, it's very different. Like the, uh, one of the things that this whole concept, I think, came about when um, the Forest Service started planting trees from different locations after logging operations, I think in the 30s and 40s, and they found that um, a lot of times the, those trees wouldn't survive and they couldn't figure it out until they started taking um, tree material from uh, what they call tree zones, right? Areas of, of similar bands of elevation that are close by. And they basically they found that if you take the material from the, the region, uh, it survives in the long term, right? So it's a, so these, these different places that have, these plants have co-evolved really make a big difference in terms of like resilience and uh, survivorship and those kinds of things. So it's, they're different, yeah. And Marguerite Di Giorgio asks uh, or comments that some Asclepias are very invasive and it helps nurseries and homeowners to know their habitat. I actually avoid the one pictured because it becomes a maintenance issue. Uh, I, I, boy, I wish I had that problem. I haven't been able to, I've killed <laughs> any number of, uh, of milkweed trying to get them to grow and I still can't get them to grow in my garden. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that, uh, I think your Dave story, your story is more common than, than, than being a, a, a problem, you know, it's sort of an invasive species, but you know. And then she also says, I've been concerned about the new fire landscaping and how it can eliminate complexity, such as cleaning under stories, under stories, trimming up branches, et cetera. Yes, grasses that stay green are important information to the homeowner. More guidance and thought about how to maintain diversity and habitat in the garden. I, I think it's really something that, and that she, she's dealing with an issue that the chapter has been 
very much involved in, which is how to create landscapes that are diverse, as you've described, and still meet the fire uh, it's defensible space guidelines. And it's yeah. we're still in the process of working that that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any any additional thoughts you had would be very much appreciated. Yeah, uh, boy, that uh, a lot of questions today uh, relating to fire and fuels and things like that. And it's, uh, yeah, I think you're in a kind of a tough spot there, right? It's uh, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, you know, I, I suppose if, um, you know, uh, um, perhaps perennial plants might might end up being a little more fire resistant than, than annuals, right? Because they're going to be, um, end up being green longer, you know, green oftentimes year round might be one one way to, to do more perennials than annuals. Um, yeah, I, I uh, um, be very selective on how you use these habitat features like we talked about earlier. You know, you don't wanna add wood next to a house, for example, um, you know, um, tough spot. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough spot, yeah, it's, it's a balancing act. Julie Whitman asks, is there an ecotype zone map for say California poppies? Um, yeah, so well, there, um, yeah, there, there are, um, there are ecotype maps that are out there. Um, let's see, um, I'm trying to think here. Um, have her send me an email and I can give her some information on where you can find, um, you know, they're called uh, provisional seed transfer zones. They're, they're maps basically based on climate um, that have been developed. Uh, I, I can provide a link to um, sort of a uh, yeah, so, so these uh, provisional seed transfer zones that have basically sim similar climatic areas that, that give some pretty good guidance, you know, in terms of like what would be appropriate for, for different locations. So, and, and, and I guess a follow-up question would be, assuming yeah. you had a, a map like that, how yeah. would you use it in purchasing uh, seed or plants? <laughs> Well, so what you want to do is you want to ask the seed or the seed provider or the nursery provider, uh, where did those plants originally come from? And then try to line that, that, that up with, uh, you know, the, the seed transfer zone, right? So, you, you, would, you know, in an ideal world, you would basically, you would get plant material from those same map locations. Now, now we're not there yet, right? So we're, we're, uh, we're a lot better than, than say, uh, we were 25, 35 years ago, right? Uh, there's a lot more ecotypes and things that are out there, but we still have a, a ways to go in terms of like dialing in lots of different choices for material that's very local. Um, but but we're closer, you know? So it's, it's uh, you know, probably have to make some compromises, right? So you do the best you can, you know, but keep in mind that uh, a lot of this material is just not not available. So no. you have to use the, the best choice that's. that's and, and, I, and I will say that there are local nurseries such as Waterhead, Watershed Nursery and Cal no. Nursery up in Fulton. If you go on their website and you look at their plant availability list, they will yeah. list the county, for example, where the stock is from, if they know. And most of it they do know. Yeah. Yeah. The Watershed Nursery in particular, they're very good at that. Uh, they're also very good at uh, phytosanitary procedures, right? So the plants that you buy from the watershed nursery uh, were grown in with clean nursery practices, getting to this idea that you don't want to spread these non-native diseases. So that's a, a, a great choice there. Yeah. And Esme Howard says native here nursery in the, in the East Bay, which is which is even more fine grained than nice. okay than, than than the others. I mean, it's very local local. Great name, native here. Over. Yeah. over over in uh, it's it's the cnps nursery in in over near okay. tilden in tilden nice okay good and stacy progazelski uh says home hardening needs to be stressed as much as vegetation management or maybe more so for home protection from fire to which i would say amen i mean that's been that's that's what we're trying to get across and and, and the fire engines agree but uh, uh only up to a point uh yeah because that's the harder nut. Because that's the, that's you've got to convince homeowners to spend money, and sometimes right. a lot of money, which is yeah. a, a bigger a bigger push than getting to cut down trees and and uh, and vegetation. Right. So it's uh, some. I think they consider defensible just clearing as as low hanging fruit, even though it's less effective perhaps than home hardening. But yeah. So, yeah. Well. That brings us to the end of the chat questions. If there are any other questions,
questions from you out there on Zoom that you would like to ask, feel free to raise your hand through the reaction button because I can only see a limited number. Pat, why don't you stop sharing your screen and we'll, I'll get yeah. more folks okay. on the screen. Sounds good. Uh, uh, so I still don't, I don't see any additional questions. So we're, uh, we're coming close to the, to the end in any case. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for a very informative talk. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. And something that we, you know, we all can take home something to, you know, to improve our gardens. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to sometime, I hope we get a chance, maybe we can take a field trip from the chapter to see one of your, your restorations. Uh, yeah, yeah. And or uh, one thing that might be of interest would be to come out to Heritage Growers and see our, our uh, you know, our farm and see these uh, natives being produced out there. When, when are you gonna have the, uh, the expanded version planted? Uh, yeah, this fall. Yeah, this fall we're, we're adding, um, like I said, uh, you know, 139 acres. So this fall we'll have the expanded version. Yeah. So right now it's fairly spectacular. It's uh, uh, we've got poppies and tidy tips and lupins and things that are in flower right now. But uh, oh, but it'll, it'll be much bigger here. Uh, yeah. This coming. This coming uh, so, next so next year at this time. Yeah. Thanks again, and uh, hope to see you all next month. Uh, we uh, we're still uh, lining up the speaker for next month but it will be uh, uh, announced through the uh, through the newsletter and special announcements which uh, hopefully you will get through uh, signing up for the newsletter uh, uh, through the chapter website so we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month thanks All again right. Pat. bye bye yeah, you're welcome. yeah thank you bye, -bye.